Over the past 50 years, boys and men have lost ground at school and work, and they're living shorter lives. They're less likely than women to graduate from high school and college or to earn advanced degrees. They're dropping out of the labor force in record numbers and account for two-thirds of so-called deaths of despair stemming from suicide, alcoholism, and drug overdoses. The Brookings Institution scholar Richard V. Reeves documents these and other equally dark developments in his new book of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It. He analyzes the structural factors exacerbating these trends, such as the changing nature of work in a post-industrial economy, and suggests solutions that don't come at the expense of women. Reeves was our guest at The Reason Speakeasy, a monthly unscripted conversation in New York City with outspoken defenders of free thinking and heterodoxy in an era of conformity and groupthink. This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's guest is Richard V. Reeves. He's a scholar uh, at the Brookings Institution down in Washington, D.C., and he's originally from England. We're going to ask him about that. I don't know. Seems problematic, but his latest book, and he's written many, is Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It. So please give a big hand to Richard V. Reeves. All right. Um, Richard, thanks for talking. Let's start with what is the um, elevator pitch of this book? That uh, in many domains of life, boys and men are now the ones who are at a disadvantage, including some, some aspects of education, some aspects of employment, and in family life. And that's especially true for uh, working class men and black boys and men. And we've got to a point now, such as being the incredible progress that we've made on gender equality on behalf of women and girls, that, although there's still further to go in many areas, that is now not only possible to look at gender inequalities that are running the other way, but in my view, necessary, and that failing to do so will actually create all kinds of political and cultural problems. So let's. Uh, one of the things that is amazing about the book is the way that you document this. Let's. Let's. We're going to spend some time going over the um, kind of the extent of the issue, or what are the indicators mm -hmm. that men are are not doing well. And some of this is because they are, you know, relative to women, they're falling behind others. It's just where they were 20, 50, 70 years ago, they're falling mm -hmm. behind. Mm -hmm. So let's work through some of that. What um, uh, I guess a, a good starting place is um, when Title IX was passed in the early 70s, which uh, conditioned federal funding uh, in educational institutions that get federal dollars, they needed to have equal opportunities for men and women. This, the disparity of women in college to men mm -hmm. was smaller than it is now. Yes. Is that right? Can you, Let's correct. start with that and then run through yeah. your list of leading indicators of where men are, are not doing so well. Yeah. So I really like how you made that distinction, Nick, right at the beginning between a relative issue where there's an inequality uh, and an absolute issue where we're actually seeing a, an absolute decline. So if you look at education, for example, you're quite right. In 1972, when Title IX was passed, men were 13 percentage points more likely to get a college degree, a four-year college degree. Uh, Title IX was passed within about 15 years. The gap had closed, and the most recent numbers show that women are now 15 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree than men are. So the gender inequality in higher education is actually slightly wider today than it was in 1972. It's just it's just flipped. It's reversed um, the other way. And it's um, when you look at the number of men going to college versus women, bigger gap or what's what's going on yeah. there? Yeah, it's in actually even bigger. It's a bit bigger there. So on college campuses now, it's about 60 percent 60 women, uh, forty percent men. A little bit less true on in private colleges because mm -hmm. private colleges are allowed to discriminate on the basis right. of sex. So they're now discriminating in favor of men to try and hold themselves closer to fifty fifty. But across the board, it's now sixty forty. And so even when men do go to college, they're less likely to complete college. So there's both an enrollment gap. There's roughly a ten percentage point enrollment gap. Enrolling and then roughly a similar gap in on-time completion. So it's, men are less likely to go, but they're also less likely to complete. The result of that is that fifteen-point gap. And at uh, you know, in graduate school, whether it's uh, law degrees or medical degrees, we're also seeing something similar, right? Yeah, uh, much more recently, uh, women now account for the majority of postgraduate degrees, including PhDs. 
Um, that is, a, so that's more recent. Uh, master's degrees, actually, that was probably 10 years ago. Um, BAs, probably 20 years ago. And so basically what we're seeing is this kind of gr- this ripple effect all the way through the education system now. So there, there is no level of education now where the gender gap doesn't, uh, doesn't go in favor of women and girls. Whereas, mm-hmm. of course, you, you don't have to go back all that far to discover, to find that it was completely the other way around. Um, and part of this, if you go back to high school, uh, there are sobering statistics, or maybe not sobering, but interesting statistics when, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I guess the, uh, you know, the slogan was the future is female. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not that's exactly true, it's certainly the case that the high achievers in high school are female. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. What are, what are Absolutely. some of the, you know, uh, yeah. findings in that? Yeah. Uh, if you take high school GPA, which is a pretty good measure and actually probably more important for college admissions now even than it was before because so many places have become test optional, so they're putting more weight on high school GPA. Actually, girls have typically always been a little bit ahead, but now they're way ahead. So if you take the top 10% of high schoolers by GPA, two-thirds of them are women, two-thirds of them are girls. And if you take the bottom 10%, two-thirds are boys with roughly a linear relationship in between the two. And so uh, if you're interested in being like going to a selective college, doing well in GPA, then uh, I'd say twice as many girls who are really killing the GPA. Yeah. Um, if you peel back to grammar school or to preschool or to, you know, whatever, what, where, where does the gender gap start or the achievement gap really start showing up at first? Well, it's there from the beginning. Uh, so just in terms of pre, in terms of school readiness, there's a gap. Um, there's a gap pretty much all the way through now. Sometimes it narrows a little bit in some subjects like math before opening up again. Interestingly, when I went into this subject, I think I had an impression that, yeah, so we know that on average, perhaps we can just preface pretty much everything we're going to say is on average, mm-hmm. right? So I don't have to say it every time. But on average, girls are much better at English. And that's certainly true. So in the typical school, in the average school district in the US now, girls are almost a grade ahead um, in terms of English. But I had this also sense, yeah, but boys are better at math, right? So does it come out in the wash? And and that's not true anymore. Uh, in the typical, in the average school district, girls have caught up with boys in math. And in poorer school districts, the girls are a long way ahead in math mm-hmm. and English. And so, the gen the gender gap in our poorer communities uh, isn't is actually much wider in English, but it's also quite wide in math as well. And so, this sense of like, it, like well, you know, mm-hmm. girl, on average, girls are better at some things, boys are better at others. That's not really true anymore. There are really no serious areas where girls aren't ahead of boys educationally. Well, um, what about related thing? I don't know, like extracurricular activities and things like that, or, or are there other ways of measuring? Like, are is it that boys and you know, and we're talking about boys here, you know, maybe through high school. Um, I think it's probably fair to call most men boys up until the age of about thirty-five or forty. <laughs> but you know, let's keep it, you know, K through twelve. Are there other places? Like, is it that well, men or boys are evacuating academics, but they're doing something else where they're, uh, you know, kind of superlative? Not really. I think if they were, then we might be less concerned about it. But um, actually, there's been a drop in extracurricular activities generally. But just to come back to you earlier, you're a bit unfair on men there, Nick, saying the 30s. You know, men's brains catch up with women's brains on average by about 25, 26. Right. So get credit where it's okay. due. You know, we, right. we catch so up a little bit earlier yeah, yeah. than you're all suggesting. Right. But by then, I have a 26-year-old son, so I'm like, yes, yeah. one down. But by then, all of the firecrackers that you've exploded in your hair and things like that. You know, you're, it's if, never going to be a full brain. If right? you make it yeah. that far, yeah. then everything else equal, you'll probably be okay, okay. Uh, in terms of brain development. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so it's, it's essentially it's all the way through that you see this difference. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about education. We've talked about education a bit, which is is a big deal, obviously. But then what about work? Mm-hmm. Um, what's going on here? And I, and I guess, actually, before we get to gender questions, you, you mentioned extracurriculars mm-hmm. are down. One of the other things that is a kind of fascinating and I, um, trend that I don't think gets uh, discussed all that much is just how uh, the idea of working when you're in high school or a yeah. teenage, that's really disappearing from the landscape much within it, yeah. twenty, you know, the past 25, 30 yeah, much, years. Yeah, much less of it. And actually, although you're talking about high school at the moment now, one of, one of the, uh, you know, sometimes you've got these big facts in the book about earnings, which we're going to get to and college graduation but there are also these sort of data nuggets that in some ways i think can speak they speak to something more profound and so one of the things i was really surprised to find for example is that if you look at people who volunteer for americorps or the peace corps 
So overseas or at home, twice as many women doing that. Right. Back in the UK, voluntary service overseas, same thing, 70% women. Yeah. And so in terms of those, those, that's not quite what you're asking right. about in terms of extracurricular, but in terms of like doing extra stuff, volunteering, going the tw two to one, same in study abroad. Right. So if you look at college students, like the number who study abroad, two to one, women to men. And it doesn't matter what the subject area is. It's not about subject area, just twice as many women choosing to study abroad as men. Now, the numbers there are pretty small. We don't really know how to interpret it, but that's a kind of really interesting data point. It's like, no one knows why, but it must be telling us something quite important because it didn't used to be the case right. that it was. And this the is the idea used to be that, well, men were, you know, men were adventurous, right? Mm -hmm. They're Odysseus. They want to roam the world yeah, and all Jack, of this Jack kind of Jack Kerouac. Stuff. Exactly. And it's yeah. like Jack Kerouac now is, on you know, sofa. he doesn't have his license. Right. Right. Yeah, well, actually, and, and there are his more girlfriend women with is licenses driving than men, actually. Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Women now have overtaken men in terms of the number of driver's licenses. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's. Even in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I can't. But, uh, but that's not that's not true. But I think we have to is, fa I think we'd have to fact check that one. Yeah, but it is but it is true. You mentioned in Saudi Arabia there are places where women are outpacing men, even in Saudi Arabia. Well, in education, uh, it's basically true almost everywhere. I mean, yeah. every OECD country for sure. But even in some Middle Eastern countries, you get you get really pretty big gender gaps in favor of women. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, you know when when under the Taliban when you know all of their uh, valedictorians are women and they can't go to graduation because there's only one burqa, <laughs> uh, you know that'll maybe then it, this will really sink in. Yeah, this uh, you know these, that women these, are, are these arguments don't there. travel all that well sometimes, yeah. do they? Yeah. Okay. Um, so well, let's talk about employment. Yeah. Um, what are what are the big trends there? Uh, you know that uh, boys and men are just kind of uh, not getting it done. So there are two. Here, I think there's a relative story and an absolute story. So the relative story is a really incredibly positive one, which is of a kind of massive catching up in terms of earnings uh, of women uh, compared to men. It doesn't mean there isn't a gender pay gap, of course, although that's mostly a parenting pay gap, which we might get into. But, but if you take in 1979, 13% of women earned more than the median man. Right, So take a guy in the middle of the distribution, only 13% of women were earning more than him. Now that's 40%. Now, 40% is not 50%, so the, the distributions aren't exactly the same, but that's an extraordinary shift. 40% mm -hmm. of American households have a female brain. Why is 1979, by the way? Because that's when the best earnings data series okay. go back to. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in the UK, people would use 1979 because it's when Thatcher was elected, right. and you wanted to say how, how everything had gone mm -hmm. either brilliantly or to hell since then. Yeah. Um, but in the, and so when I came to the US and I noticed everyone doing 79, I was like, wow, oh, they're obsessed with mm -hmm. Thatcher as well. Yeah. Uh, and it so turns maybe, out- it's Dennis, it's, it's Dennis because Thatcher <laughs> was the canary in the coal mine, right? He's like the first house husband in, in international politics. Well, it, I mean, actually, the UK is now, of course, yeah. we're on our third female prime minister, and no, right. one, no one really bats an eyelid anymore, and a, th yeah. a third of MPs are women and let's, in the UK. And uh, you know, the chromosome tests on Boris Johnson were kind of indeterminate, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, no, I think they were yeah. pretty definitive. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, well, let's talk about so, so earnings, from sorry. since so they, 79. So the, the gender pay gap has closed quite a bit, and that's great. So what you're just seeing is, as you'd expect from an equality, Quality movement, women catching up with men. Um, but there's also a, a different story, which is the absolute story, which is that depending on how you measure it, most American men today are earning less than most American men did in 1979. Not all. The ones at the mm -hmm. top are earning more than the ones at the top did because we've seen a big increase in economic inequality in that period, especially during the 80s. It's important mm -hmm. to point out. But median male wages are a little bit down uh, on most measures, which means that just as an overall group, What's happened uh, to men is that you've seen this big split. So most men earning less, some men earning a lot more, whereas for women, earnings have increased across the board mm -hmm. and especially at the top. And is that, when you say earnings, is that total compensation or is that salary? It's both, but the right. ones I'm referring to are mostly salary. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then if we are, what about the, the percent of men who are in the workforce, um, you know, because and unemployment rates, which, you know, are, are most typically cited in press accounts, are kind of it. useless in a lot of this yeah. because they're subject to a lot of kind of Correct. gaming or, or, you know, they just don't capture. But if we're looking at the labor force participation rate, particularly what's considered prime 
age age. men. So that's 25 year olds or people 25 to 54. I know. It's depressing, isn't it? Yeah, well, no, I've known I've been past my prime for a long time before I was 54. I'm 53. So so I'm I'm launching a campaign to redefine prime age. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Good luck with that. Depressing number because I'm about to hit the end of my prime age. All right. But you're, 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 you're an inspiration. Nick. Oh, uh, yes, I am. As a, as an 80-year-old, I continue to earn exactly the same amount as I was 20 years ago. But, so. you're, but you're right. Among prime-age men, there's been a decline in labor force participation generally. Again, depending exactly how you measure it, it was around 7 percentage points in the last decades. But the class dimension here is really important too because you're still seeing pretty good labor force participation among more educated men. Mm-hmm. But among less educated men, a real cratering. So among men with a high school education and no more, about one in three are out of the labor market. And that's about 10 million men. And what does that compare to, you know, say in 1979, what would it have been? I don't know what it was in 1979, but I know it was significantly higher. Yeah. Um, uh, And as you just alluded to, in a sense, the the issue isn't is more troubling because most of them are not unemployed in the sense of actively seeking work. Right. They're actually detached from the labour market, and nor, if you look at what they're doing, is it because they have become the Dennis Thatchers? Uh, mm-hmm. They're not house husbands by and large. Right. I think that would be a very different story, and honestly, one I think a lot of us were hoping for, which is we'd see this reversal of gender roles. And so, if the guys are out of the workforce because they're home right. raising kids, that's one thing. But by and large, they appear not to be doing that. So, what are they doing? And uh, keep it clean. This is a family program. Sure, sure. So. Well, I can refer you to a very, a very good new report by Nick Eberstadt out mm-hmm. of the American Enterprise Institute on uh, men not working, uh, where he really digs into it. And Which I think is the name of the study, right? Correct. Men not, men not working. working. Yeah, yeah. And he's done a like post-pandemic edition. Um, uh, so men not in the labor force, or some people refer to them as NILFs, mm. but I'm. <laughs> But but I've learned that in the Except US... Except nobody wants to fuck them. No. That's right? a, I mean, if we're being honest. That's the main reason to work. Well, well my, now we're into a whole new chapter mm. of the book about yeah. the marriage market. Right. Um, but I'm told that NILFs is not a good term for them for yeah. the reason you've just demonstrated. Um, but, but the truth is, actually, like we do, and in many cases, we don't really know. I mean, it's mm. something of a mystery. We do know that a disproportionate number of those men are uh, on pain meds. Alan Kruger's mm-hmm. work showed that. Um, disproportionately subject to opioids. Uh, sometimes it's not even clear exactly what their sources of income are, or mm-hmm. that they could be living with parents again, or whatever. Um, and some of them are doing some parenting as well. I don't want to say none yeah. of them are doing that. But by, by and large, they seem not only to be detached from the labor market, mm-hmm. But in a sense, more troublingly, quite detached from family life and community life as well. Um, and so Catherine Eden has done some very good work on this where she talks about the, the haphazard self. And it's men kind of trying to improvise their way through life mm-hmm. without those anchors. And a lot of those uh, are the men we're seeing in that group. Um, are they um, are they on disability? Are they, mm-hmm. you know, and quite this is why on. the yeah. labor force participation rate is generally regarded a better measure of like what's going on because – it doesn't ask whether or not you've been looking for work recently or anything like that, or you're discouraged. Yes. It's just, this is the number of people in this demographic and they're either working or not. Right. And once they're on disability, of course, there there are- They would be taken off unemployment, I believe, Correct. right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And obviously Scott Winship, as yeah. uh, you know, has done work on this. And I, the problem is that the way the disability system is constructed is that if you're on it and your labor market prospects aren't that good anyway, mm-hmm. then the incentives to get off it aren't very good. Right. Because lots of other things get bundled with that in terms mm-hmm. of health care and so on. And so it can become some that that can become something of a trap, mm-hmm. uh, and that seems to be catching particularly these le- these less educated men. Um, talk about health outcomes, um, because uh, you know one of the things I I have to uh, you know confess to kind of uh, not thinking about COVID much anymore. Um, but there is a stark outcome in you know male death rates versus female death rates in COVID. That Correct. is another place where men just are really not doing well. Correct, yeah. And actually, the, the COVID story is an interesting one of the test of this overall debate, I think, because the evidence started to become clear that men were dying at significantly higher rates. So <laughs> especially in middle age, middle-aged American men are about have been about twice as likely to die from COVID as women and age adjusted across the world, it's at least 50% higher risk of death for men than, than for women. So there's this very, very clear, well-documented uh, gap. And first of all, it's quite difficult to get people talking about that mm-hmm. at all. You know, I did some work on this and it was quite difficult. Well, because to get the ones there. who care the most about it are dead. 
Well, it could be that it's hard to okay. mobilize them, yeah. right? But it also go, went against a bit of a narrative. Actually, the strong narrative at the time was just how terrible COVID was going to be for women, in particular economically. Um, meanwhile, there was this much bigger death rate among men. But then the next reaction was, okay, even if it's true, it must be their fault. Mm -hmm. um, for not wearing masks or getting vaccinated. Okay, that doesn't true either. The case rates are the same. Okay, it's not that then. Oh, it's because they drink and smoke too much. So they've got all these kind of pre-existing health conditions, it turns out. That wasn't true either. The, the gap remains when you control for all that. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is it then? And it turns out it's just a biological vu vulnerability. There's something to do with ACE receptors. Mm -hmm. If there's any doctors in the room, now's a great time to weigh in and tell me what's happening because I'm not an expert. But, but it's now quite clear that men are biologically more vulnerable to a virus like this. That was just mm -hmm. true. Now, does that matter? Well, it might matter a bit in terms of how you think about vaccination policy. It might matter how you're marketing the vaccines and so on. Um, but it seemed to me like an important fact that was not explained in the easy way that people were trying to explain it away. Um, but talking about deaths of despair, men are also- Much more likely. Three you know, times setting the pace there. Three well, times more likely to die from a so-called death of despair. This is And can you, uh, you know, briefly kind of summarize that or yeah, explain what that is? Yeah, this is a term which, popularized by Angus Dayton and Anne Case. Um, and, and essentially what it does, it takes three sources of, of death to get suicide, a drug-related death, or an alcohol-related death, and put those together. And the, the rates are rising for men and women, but they're three times higher for men mm -hmm. than for women. Uh, if you break each one down, they're roughly the same. And so there's been a big increase in those deaths of despair, but there is also a massive gender disparity. And again, it cross cuts with class. Mm -hmm. uh, the most of those at most risk are actually white working class men um, who are dying in the greatest numbers. And uh, again, opioid deaths, about 70% men. And the interesting thing about the opioid deaths, and again, it's one of those in, like nug data nuggets. One of the reasons why people are more likely to die from an opioid overdose is because they're on their own. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about certain drugs, there are certain drugs you might take to kind of go, go out to the club, right? You might take MDMA or something, mm -hmm. or to chill with your friends or weed. But, but opioids are a drug of retreat. And so one of the reasons why people die is there's no one there. Uh, they are very often indoors and alone, and that's particularly true of men. Hmm. Um, are there any, uh, before we talk about the causes of, of these disparities, are there any places where men are affirmatively doing better. And and I guess it's worth pointing out that even though men's labor force participation rate is declining, it is still higher than the female rate, Correct. which has been increasing for decades. Now. Correct. Although the female one in the US has leveled out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's continuing to rise in other countries, which is uh, uh, causing a very interesting debate about whether that's because other countries do a better job of mm -hmm. allowing mothers in particular right. to combine paid work with raising kids. But So it's actually leveled off for, for women too. But you're quite right. The labor force participation rates are right. still higher for men. Um, but the reason why women aren't in the labor force is because they're caring. Right. You know, it's almost always the case that you look at a woman who's not in the labor force, not looking for work, and you know, what is she doing? And she's usually a mum or sometimes caring for parents. Right. But she's she's doing something that she's we can identify. She's taking care of Jughead Jones, right? I mean, of a, of a non-working man, perhaps. Well, maybe. I don't. Yeah. I think increasingly a lot of those women are like, you know what? I don't need another mouth to feed. In fact, yeah. that's what Catherine Eden's work finds, mm -hmm. is that one of the reasons why men end up on their own is because – if the woman is the main, if women are breadwinning and they're caring, there is a really, a serious question, which is like, what are you for right. to the guy? Well, you know, as somebody who uh, is a uh, the grandson of Irish immigrants, I've heard this story before. In fact, <laughs> I've heard it most of my life, uh, where the question is always to the man, "What are you? What, what are you for? here for?" Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, are there places that where men are doing yeah. better, or yeah. where they are making gains, whether in absolute terms or relative? Yeah. Terms? So uh, economically. Uh, um, men in the U.S. do seem to be um, worse off than men in other uh, Western European economies. So it's, it does seem like the trends for male wages in particular are worse here than in other places. So that's one thing. I also think, again, a class dimension, which is that actually upper middle class men, however we're going to define them, but men with four-year college degrees, decent earnings, their earnings are higher. Than men at the top were before. They're still going. They're still going to college. The, the gender gap at the top of the distribution is much less than at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Their marriage rates are still really high by comparison to everybody else. They're still developing wealth, and so actually, there's a, a lot of men who are in the more upper echelons of society who are still doing pretty well, mm -hmm. and who've managed to a, adjust to a world mm -hmm. of much greater gender equality without actually apparently suffering any of these dislocating consequences that working class men have. Is there also, uh, uh, you know, I've heard it called various things, but a kind of harem effect that, you know, men at the top who are doing well, 
you know, have, you know, they are not only making more money, but they have mm-hmm. access to more women. Mm-hmm. I mean, because of the way things have changed, but it's pretty good if you're in the top 20% of the income distribution and you're a man. Yeah. We're not going to compare harem sizes, are we? I would point, never right? think to do so. <laughs> no. No. So, well, I think there is a serious point there. Interesting, Utah just decriminalized polygamy. So that, that'll be a nice social science uh, experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you see that on dating apps. I will say, say up front, I am not an expert on Tinder. Mm-hmm. But but you're it, working hard to become one. <laughs> but, yeah. so, but a very good friend of mine, mm-hmm. Tinder, I'm happily married. A very good friend of mine on Tinder has, and it's now well established, it's been talked, you know, there are studies showing this, is that uh, those dating apps are creating something like these kind of old effects that you would have where high status men um, are actually able to have you know, be dating uh, many women, whereas like 50% of men just don't get any, any, any matches mm-hmm. at all. And that is actually, that's how, that's how things were for most of human history, of course. It's a very, very new thing not to have the problem of surplus males as you know, some men um, are having kind of multiple wives or multiple partners. But in society generally, the idea of a kind of monogamous uh, relationship within marriage still seems pretty strong, right. especially among the upper middle class. So you know, the very men that who you would in other cultures would be able to perhaps have multiple wives don't. Mm. Jeff Bezos doesn't have multiple wives. Mm. Elon Musk doesn't have multiple wives. Right. But... <laughs> You might see something on effect there too, and mm-hmm. as J- Joe Henrik, the evolutionary. Just imagine right? how successful he would be if the hair plugs looked good. <laughs> he's doing, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. he's doing pretty well um, on that front. Certainly, he's doing. He's worried about fertility, so he's mm-hmm. obviously doing his bit on that front. Um, but actually, Joe Henrik makes this point that says you always talk about polygamy, and we say like, of course, men would want it, right? Of course, they would want mm-hmm. to have a, a world like that. But he actually makes the point that it's restricting. He's not in favor of it, but restricting women's choices as well. And so an interesting poll, an interesting question to ask people is, would you rather be Jeff Bezos's third wife or your, you know, your high school boyfriend's only wife? Mm-hmm. Right. Now, it may be that all women would say their high school boyfriend, even if he's unemployed or whatever, but, but it's an I interesting know. You question. Know, I, have prime. Maybe we'll I, I thought people. you were asking me. I'm okay, ready well, to well, be <laughs> Jeff Bezos's third, third wife. Third wife, wife. Yeah, you know, yeah like, okay. Well, I didn't expect that. You know, it's just every two days you have yeah. to produce, right? Yeah, I'm already I'm already regretting opening that door for you. Um, so, are there other places though where um, you know where things are going well for men? Um, yeah, certain places are doing better too, and so some states seem to be doing better. Obviously, the ones that've been hit hardest by manufacturing, you know, the deaths of mm-hmm. despair, and and actually, interestingly, the places where the deaths of despair were highest and where male employment had dropped the most were the ones that swung most strongly from Romney's share to Trump's share in twenty sixteen. I'm sorry, what, what does that mean? Explain that. The deaths of despair. Bit, no, the no, there's the swing. So, so if, Romney did poorly. No, no, no. Or? Just no, no. So even if Romney won, in the, how much? How much did Trump outperform Romney? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and you could predict that quite strongly by how many deaths of despair there were in that county. So when Trump came along and said, you know, American carnage. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I say this in the book, I think. You know, at the time, I was just like rolling my eyes and just thinking it was ridiculous hyperbole. But I now think it was just hyperbole. And I think he knew who he was speaking to. He was speaking mm-hmm. to certain communities that really did feel devastated by the loss of many of these traditionally male jobs and the rise of the opioid epidemic and so on. So for, th- for those people, that language didn't sound hyperbolic. Um, that might be a good way to start talking about the causes of some of these trends. Because, you know, when we talk about deindustrialization, I, I went to graduate school in Buffalo from 1990 to 93. And people in 1990, and this, you know, was around the time that NAFTA was being, um, you know, kind of crafted and finally passed. And they were like, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we've, you know, all the industrial jobs have gone and they'll, or they're going to go because of NAFTA. But in fact, they were already gone. They were gone in 1970. They were gone. They peaked in 1950. Mm-hmm. And the share of the American economy uh, for industrial work was in like 1943. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is it, I mean, is deindustrialization, how does that tie into this crisis of masculinity? Because it seems like, I mean, it's just a straight line decline from, yes. you know, World War II on. Like, so it it just seems odd that we're still talking about, you know, the last manufacturing job in southwestern Ohio is the reason why men suddenly are doing so poorly. Well, you're right. The trend has been has been continuous. 
uh, but I, that doesn't necessarily mean that we've adjusted to it even now. And so I think that just the economic shock of free trade and to some extent automation has disproportionately affected men. It's a, a affected working class men in particular and it is probably so, more automation i mean most studies say that i think it's more it's automation. less than it's less trade and it's more automation that has changed industrial work i think that's right and also if you look at the good studies of the impact of china entering wto you do see some effects on manufacturing mm -hmm. jobs but quite geographically restricted um you know and it also one of the reasons why the men didn't do better was because they didn't move to other jobs mm -hmm. Uh, either geographically or occupationally. And so, but there is this issue, there's a lag here. And honestly, some of the politicians don't help because they do sometimes give the impression that just, just give us another term and we can bring all those factory jobs back. And so we keep sort of holding out this illusion that we can somehow reverse the tide. And that, and I think that doesn't help men in particular to, to in a sense, face the music and mm -hmm. say, look, okay, those jobs, the jobs that my dad was able to do for a good wage with a high school education are gone, mm -hmm. gone for good. So I need to rethink my labor market strategy here. And A, we're not talking about that, but B, we're not really helping men to adjust mm -hmm. to that world through things like helping them get into some of the growing jobs in health and education, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the other, you know, let's, let, I guess let's start with grammar school and high school. What explains men doing more poorly now uh, or boys doing more poorly now versus 30 or 50 years ago? Well, uh, some of them are doing worse in absolute terms, but mostly it's been this relative shift. It's just been the way that, as we talked about earlier, that girls and women have just like blown past men, which by the way, no one expected. If you go back to the 70s when we were fighting for gender equality in education, nobody said, well, what, what, if, what if the lines keep going? At what point will we start to worry about gender inequality mm -hmm. the other way around? Because no one, no one expected it. People just expected there would be rough parity. parity. We'd yeah. get to parity and it would level out. I think what's happened is that by taking the brakes off women's educational aspirations and opportunities, um, it's exposed the fact that the current education system is some structured to be somewhat more female friendly um, because girls mature early than boys. And when I say mature, I mean like just actually neuroscientifically, their prefrontal cortex develops earlier, partly because they hit puberty earlier. Um, and so they're just more advanced. Um, uh, and, and to some extent, the style of learning might be, might be a little bit more female friendly than male friendly. Obviously, we've seen a huge shift towards more female teachers. There are fewer than one in four K-12 teachers are now male and that's dropping. And so- What, but, what did it like, used to be? I, I mean, so I, I graduated, uh, just to inject useless autobiography, I graduated high school in 1981 and I- can count on one hand, like the number of male teachers I had in high school. Okay. Um, when when were men, you know, I don't know, 50 years yeah. ago, what, was it 50% of school teachers in were high men school or in high was, school? Yeah, yeah. in high school, the, so the drop in high school has been much greater. It's now mm -hmm. majority female in high school. I don't, I, the exact numbers aren't quite at my fingertips, but in elementary school, men have always been in a minority, but that's dropping as well. It's one in 10. In early years education, there are basically no men. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other... One of the other uh, ways to illustrate that is about 3%. One of my own sons works in early years education, and only about 3% of early years educators are men, which as a share of the profession is about half as many women as there are flying U.S. military jets. Hmm. So we now have twice as many women flying U.S. military planes as we do uh, men teaching kindergarten as a share of the professions. And I want to be clear that I would like I'd like lots more women flying military mm. jets. Or to be even clearer, I just want the best people flying. I want women jets. to be care. drafted I rather just, rather than men. I, I think that's uh, well. You know, payback. We, we got very very yeah. close to including women in the yeah. draft, and then Josh Hawley did a deal with Kirsten Gillibrand to knock it out at the eleventh hour, which yeah. is super interesting. Um, I think well, I, I you know close. this is a libertarian event, so I just want to point out that it's great the that there is no draft, right? But well, there is. But, there is still, I mean, it's not actually enacted, but you, men still have to register. That is true. I mean, yes. it's like everyone who's had three but sons knows that they are. Yeah. In fact, one of my sons failed to do it, and I had to do it for him because I was going to get fined. Well, you're part um, of the problem now, right? You're, you're bailing them out. But the good yeah, thing is you true. register at the post office, so you know that it it just yeah. goes down the garbage chute. <laughs> <shooters. laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah. But the... Um, the point about yeah. early years education is that I, I would, I'm going to humbly suggest that the lack of men in education is a bigger problem than the lack of women in the military. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting for a moment we shouldn't continue to fight for a gender equality in the military, but in terms of the message we're sending to the next generation, in terms of the culture and ethos of those institutions, yeah. I, would, I would say that it's a bigger problem that there are fewer and fewer yeah. men in teaching. 
So, so education seems to be more female, female friendly, friendly than yep. it was maybe half a century ago. No, I think what's happened is it always was hmm. to some extent, but that, that we can now see it. Actually, actually, girls were doing a bit better in high school in the 60s mm-hmm. in terms of GPA, a little bit better, like, which made no sense whatsoever given the incentives that they, they, they had. So the structural advantages that women and girls had in the education system was camouflaged by sexism. Mm-hmm. Right? When women weren't going to college and weren't encouraged to go to college or to pursue an education, and uh, then, then we couldn't see it. Once we took the brakes off, it became apparent mm-hmm. that, that actually they had an advantage, and which is why they've blown right past. And so it's paradoxical. I think it took the women's movement to expose the fact that the education system is a bit more female-friendly mm-hmm. and probably always was, but we, kept a, we didn't know that because we were saying to boys, you should go to college. And we were saying to girls, find yourself a nice husband. And mm-hmm. amazingly, that meant we didn't see um, the advantages that women had. And so I want to be clear that the taking the, of the breaks off women's educational opportunities has been just one of the most amazing and positive changes in recent history. But it's also exposed the fact that we may have a few boys to worry about now. Um, let's talk about higher education. Um, you know, higher education. And, uh, you know, I, I think enough people are of uh, relatively my vintage or have seen movies like Book Smart and whatnot. But you know, it. You know, when I know when I was in high school, and you know, girls were always the valedictorian and salutatory, and you would say, "Well, you know, they're book smart. They're not really smart. Mm, they're not street, uh, you know, they just study, smart. and they, yeah. you know, they spend time doing their homework." Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we get to college, where real intelligence matters, you know, boys will do well. But mm. why aren't boys going into college or flourishing when they get there? Well, because it turns out that being if, if being book smart means turning in your homework and going to class and studying for tests, then the higher education system rewards all of those things too. There is no significant difference in cognitive ability between uh, girls and boys, pretty much any age actually. So if just in terms of like you know, wh- whatever you want to think of that is, just raw, in- raw intelligence defined however. But there's a big difference is in what, uh, what some people call non-cognitive skills which is more about organization, planfulness, future orientation, the ability to, um, to make decisions now that are going to pay off in the long term. So the prefrontal cortex is the bit of your brain that says, don't go to the party, do your chemistry homework. Mm-hmm. And it develops much later in boys than in girls. And I can tell you, having raised three boys, that raising boys is essentially being a substitute prefrontal cortex for about 10 years. Right? They don't have one. The school system thinks they have one and right. keeps saying things like, you have to do your homework and turn it in. There's no way a boy's going to be able to do that on average. So you have to do it for them. Is- and by the way, I think that's why the gender gap is much smaller in upper middle class families because yeah. upper middle class parents are doing that for them or making sure they're doing it. They're on them. They're checking online, do your homework, etc. So they are being a substitute prefrontal cortex. And is there a path dependency there where if you're not doing that in high school, you're less likely to do it? When you, if you go to college, I think you do develop the skills for sure, but but actually, I I really want to emphasise some of these just biological differences in the pace of development, because otherwise there's a bit of a tendency to just you know yell at your sons, why can't you be more like your sister? What's wrong with you? Um, and so yeah. what that does is it individualizes the problem. It makes it say, well, and actually it's not their fault <laughs> that their brains are developing a little bit uh, slower. And it's not their fault that the education system is rewarding skills that they might have on average a little bit less. And so by, by stressing the, the skills element to it, it has the, it has the potential consequence of saying it's basically their fault. And I don't think it really is by and large their fault. Is there um, something to the? I've heard this brooded about usually by people, uh, you know, who are talking about the need to help men or boys gain. Um, do you think being a boy has been pathologized in, you know, a social or cultural or educational setting? And this is the idea, you know, uh, we don't hear about this as much anymore. And it might be that uh, the trends have changed, or we mm. just don't care. But uh, you know, boys were much more likely to be diagnosed with ADD or yeah, ADHD. Sure. And is it is yeah. it because they have it, or is it because by being boys, that's disruptive in an environment where it's no longer tolerated? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, it's it's quite clear to me, looking back on my own school experience, I would definitely have been diagnosed with it now. Mm-hmm. I, I actually kind of remember just the sense of physical pain I had sitting on a very uncomfortable plastic chair, in incredibly boring class 
trying to survive it by making up imaginary worlds in my head and so on just to physically survive uh, in school so there's no question I, and I, I was in remedial english i couldn't i couldn't focus um uh, and actually i've experienced some of that with my own sons as well it's actually diagnosing them that you know made the doctor look at me and go yeah well you can yeah. see where they get it from and i was like what are you talking about mm. uh, and then it became clear that's true but at the margins, it's also that a danger that it does get pathologized. And right now, about one in four boys are diagnosed with some kind of developmental disability. That's a really high number. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that that can be right. I think if you're labeling one in four of any group as having a developmental disability, then I'm looking to the institution. I'm saying maybe your measures of disability need to be looked at. Maybe you're presuming they need to behave in a certain way in order to not be disabled. And I think that that is happening. And and one of the reasons for wanting more male teachers is that male teachers are a little bit better on average at not pathologizing male behavior, maybe because they themselves are men, um, and not seeing it as necessarily problematic that they're behaving in a certain way. Uh, and so I do think there's a danger we're over-diagnosing for sure, especially around ADHD. Autism, not quite so much. Autism seems like, so I think that's a real gender difference in mm -hmm. terms of autism. And it's more likely to affect boys. Much more. Yeah. Um, what about the... Um question of, uh, you know, well, let's talk about biology uh, mm -hmm. then, because, mm -hmm. you know, how, how does that factor into, you know, I, I think people can infer what you mean, how it affects education, particularly in K through 12, or maybe K through eight. Um, but bi biologically, how is that, how, how does biology disadvantage men? And this is kind of controversial in the context of the book, because it's, mm -hmm. you know, we are coming off of uh, at least a couple of millennia where you know, it was always advantageous to be male. And, you know, male is the universal subject. The default human is male, et cetera. But you kind of make the case that, you know, biologically uh, men, you know, have uh, some issues that are kind of hard hardwired in. Yeah, I try to abuse, avoid the use of the term hardwired. Mm -hmm. I've been advised that's not, not a good term. And I, and I think for good reason. Yeah, it, it, it yes. feels too fatalistic. It, 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 and it, it understates the plasticity uh, of our brains. Um, the, so what's not controversial is the timing of brain development, which we've already discussed. Mm -hmm. So let's just, and that's what I focus most on, because there's no controversy about the fact that, you know, these, some of these uh, bits of brain development happen earlier in girls and boys on average. Now, once you get to adulthood, let's say 25, just to remind you that it's 25, not 38 or whatever you said earlier, that, that actually male brains kind of catch up with female brains. What are the remaining differences? And I do have a chapter on that, and some people advise me against including it. Mm -hmm. Arguably, I didn't need it for the argument of the book. But the reason I kept it was because I didn't find that many good faith treatments of this issue. Mm -hmm. I think people have really dug in on this. And you either have to take the view that there are no differences at all between men and women in psychology or preferences that are rooted in biology. There's none. It's all socialization. Or you have to take the view that there are huge differences and they explain everything. No wonder there are no women engineers. Their brains aren't like that, mm -hmm. right? And so you get this overweighting of biology on one side and this denial of biology on the other side. And most of the rest of us are just like, well, they're both idiots, right? Right. We all know there are some differences. And so the reason I put it in and I talk about some particular things around risk-taking, for example, like men are on average more likely to be take to take risks th than women because I don't, think it's, I don't think it's right to necessarily say good or bad. I think it depends mm -hmm. on the circumstances. Are, are some of the traits in men less adaptive to the modern world? Like risk-taking, if it's true on average that men are a bit more risk-taking than women, which does seem to be true, is that a good or a bad thing? And I would say it's, it's neither, it depends on the circumstances. And I found this one study I really loved, which was that in companies with male CEOs and CFOs, they were a bit more profitable, but also a bit more likely to go bankrupt. So they either made a lot of money or they went bankrupt, crudely put. Those with female CEOs and CFOs were not as profitable, but they were much less likely to go bankrupt. And what about uh, those with hermaphroditic uh, I don't CEOs. think they were you in know, the study. They were right down the middle. But you know, the uh, is, We're always looking for that. Well, well of course, what, so what does that mean for how you should construct your boards? Now, you might you say, know. well, if we want a sort of, I know I'm using the terms loosely now, but a high yeah. testosterone, you know, capitalist society. We want lots of companies failing and profiting mm. and crashing and burning all over. We want lots of creative destruction. So great, let's let the men run everything. Mm. And if you want a, 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 an economy that's sort of much more stable, less profitable, but like, you know, doesn't keep collapsing and throwing mm. millions of people out of work, then maybe you want the women to run the economy. All you want to say is, wouldn't it be good to have the best of both? Right. And actually have women on boards as well as men on boards and have the mix of skills. So to the extent there are differences on averages, you can try and get a bit of both rather than having to say one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. um, 
in work, uh, you know, what are the causes of men falling behind? Well, we've talked about the industrialization. I, mm-hmm. I think that's that's a huge shock to the economy that has happened simultaneously with the rise of women in the economy. Mm-hmm. It's not men aren't doing worse in the economy because women are doing better in the economy. Mm-hmm. That's a really, really important point to make. It's too much a zero sum around that particular question. And this, if, if I may just say, I mean, one of the things that I found most um, compelling about your book is that it's one of the only treatments I've read of this issue where um, you that is you you are not saying this is zero sum, and right. so if we want if we want men to do better, women must do worse. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. now course, you know, and that which is just madness. Yeah, and that's true. I think in most cases. So then people would say, to be fair to my critics, someone would say, well, hold on, all those stats you just gave on education were relative shares. Mm-hmm. So there is a little bit like it, it, like yeah. if you want fifty if you want fifty percent of your high GPAs or college students to be men and you and you're restricting the number of there are then there is a degree of, of zero sum to that extent. But as a general proposition, what we want is everyone to flourish and everyone mm-hmm. to rise too. And so so we've seen this shock to the economy. And then I think a couple of other things are important to say on on employment. One is that the growth areas in the economy are more in the service sector and especially in in health, education type mm-hmm. type areas. Um, psychology, social work, um, you know, even like substance abuse counselors, obviously for very sad reasons, that's a hugely growing profession. They're all very female oriented and by and large becoming more so. Hmm. It's not just that they're female oriented, they're becoming more so. Even if men are more likely to be substance abusers? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem is that, so you have a number of professions now where most of the clients are male, uh, but most of the providers are female. I think that is a problem. Um, obviously, you can argue about that. Another example is special needs teachers. So most special needs teachers are, are women, but mm-hmm. most special needs, most of the students referred to special needs, unsurprisingly, given what mm-hmm. we've discussed, are boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there is some evidence that actually a match between provider is is a good thing. I think one more example is psychology, uh, where the share of the share of psychologists who are male has dropped from thirty nine percent to twenty nine percent just in the last decade. Among psychologists under the age of thirty, only five percent are male. So psychology is becoming essentially a female profession. It didn't used to be, as those numbers I just suggested show, but it really is. So if you're a guy looking for a male psychologist, pretty hmm. soon, good luck finding one. Um, does that also correspond with uh, psychology? And I could see this in other fields. And this is a, a stat or a trend that I was uh, taught in a women's studies class sometime in the early 80s, but that um, psychologists are earning less, uh, you know, that as fields, and I mm-hmm. guess there's a question of what comes first, but mm-hmm. as a, as a field becomes more dominated by women, its status and a pay and its pay tends to decline. Yeah. Is that going on here? I think it was going on. Mm-hmm. And there is some evidence for that, that you saw professions as they became more female were earning less. And so this is like pediatrics as it became yeah. a but province I, of I women. I've got to tell became- you though, a lot of the studies are, are looking at things like women into Soviet medicine in okay. the 70s. And and so I'm not saying they were wrong, but I'm not sure it's still true today. Mm-hmm. And so what we have to do is look at professions like law and medicine, which are now 50-50, or pharmacy, which is now 65 mm-hmm. women, 60, maybe 60-40 women. So you've now got these professions that are really becoming much more... What's, let's see what happens to the pay there. Mm-hmm. So we can see what happens. But I think that's... I. I don't think that's really the main reason why those professions are paid less. So K-12 teachers, for example, are not partic- they haven't seen much of a pay rise in the last 20 years. Is that because it's more female dominated? Mm-hmm. I don't think it is. I think it's for other reasons about budgeting and unions mm-hmm. and so on. Um, I think there are other artificial things going on that are capping teachers' pay rather than people saying, well, only women do it, so let's pay it less. Mm-hmm. Hard to disprove that thought, of course. But. Do men, uh, and this, again, uh, kind of pulling in biography, at least of my uh, various relatives, and they know who they are, they wouldn't be able to listen to this because I don't know that they have internet access. But uh, men, uh, you know, a lot of men, you know, their their dream is not to work. Um, you know, is how much do things like disability payments or coming up with a way where you can kind of do that ad hoc you know, life where you, you know, you're not living a good life, but you're, you're getting by. Um, does that explain, you know, the decrease in, in employment and things like that? Well, I think you'd have to believe that at the margins, if the alternative to employment is cheaper and or more appealing than it used to be, hmm. then 
that's got to be having an effect. And I think that with the drop in the, the price of technology in particular and the increase in the quality of technology, I mean, just video gaming, for example, is just stupendously awesome and very cheap mm-hmm. uh, and actually provides probably a lot of sense of purpose and structure that you know people want. But I did look quite hard at the evidence on video gaming and pornography. Those are the ones that are typically pointed to. Um, and I don't really find very strong evidence that that's having a big, either of them are having a big employment effect or that there's really a strong demand among very many men to spend their lives playing video games and looking at porn. I, I do think that's more of a stereotype than the truth, honestly. And then when you look at what men say they want, like men are much more likely to say that marriage is important to them than women, for example. Um, men who aren't in employment or in family life, their mental health is not very good. So... Look, I'm not saying it's like for some men in their 20s or a certain period of time, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you couldn't have a perfectly decent existence you know, with your friends and with some weed and, and, and some video gaming. But as a general proposition, it, it's, it's really not true that that's what most men want or that, they're see- or that they're actually seeking and almost no evidence that it's affecting their employment. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be that it's affecting their supply on the labor side. Um, before we go on to what the uh, right and the left get wrong, you know, just in crude political terms. Uh, can we talk a little bit about, in in the book, you, you talk about specifically as bad as the trends are for men overall, and then particularly for lower income or men coming out of lower income backgrounds, uh, the effect on black men mm-hmm. is particularly, you know, that seems to be the strongest case. What What's going on there? Yeah. So I think if you, there's this term from Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, intersectionality. Right. Uh, which uh, is an insistence that we can't just look at binaries. We have to look at compounded advantages and disadvantages. We have to look at race, you know, gender, disability status, mm-hmm. class, etc. Um, and I think if you take that seriously, then what it means is you look at, say, black women and men, and you don't presume from the outset that because the, the black men are men, that they are better off than the women. And it turns out that they're not. Uh, and so on most of the measures of gender equality we've talked about, it's much bigger for black men and black women. So in college, for example, it's already two to one college degrees going to black women versus black men. Black men have only seen about, have been almost no pay increase um, since 79, even though overall they're trying to catch up after you know decades of discrimination. Um, and so, And white women now earn way more than black men. They didn't used to, but now for every, every uh, dollar earned by a white woman, a black man earns 84 cents, which is about the same as the overall gender gap, actually. And so these these categories are getting really scrambled. Um, and on pretty much every dimension you can kind of look at in terms of health, life expectancy, employment, obviously incarceration, et cetera, you know, black men are really the ones that I think you can see the most acute version of some of the challenges we've talked about. And that plays out into family life as well. Black fathers, in some ways, are having to pioneer a new way of being fathers because the, um, the idea of having having lost the traditional male breadwinner role, well, that's not a recent loss to a lot of black men. Hmm. And so in some ways, they're pioneering different kinds of relationships with their kids that I think we can learn from. But overall, if you were to sort of be behind a veil of ignorance and you, were, you, knew, your, you knew your race, but you, didn't, you had to, which gender you were going to be, I think it's, ob- it's still true that if you're white and you then you'd probably bet on most measures, you're still better off being male. But that's not true for black. Hmm. Um, you know, black women are much more likely to be upwardly mobile, much more likely to be employment. Black uh, in black families, women are the breadwinners in most black families, hmm. and so on. And so the 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 crude binary around gender really gets upturned when you look specifically at the issues faced by black men. So I think that black men are worse off, not despite being men, but in some cases because they're men. Black what, masculinity is partic- is particularly seen as difficult. What what explains that? Because we I I think. We would uh, agree that things like uh, you know, certainly de jure discrimination, but even de facto discrimination is less. Um, why would the effects on black men be so much more intense? Well, I, I, ironically, black men really got hit by a lot of deindustrialization trends we've talked about because black men had actually just, I mean, just made it into many of those jobs from previously much less well paid jobs, mm-hmm. had broken into those jobs just as deindustrialization hit them. So actually, the impact of the loss of manufacturing jobs has been bigger for black men than white men. That's not what you'd think of in terms of general narrative. So they've been hit very, very hard by uh, those trends. Obviously, the way the war on drugs and the war on crime became, in effect, a war on black men. So I actually talk about my godson who was raised in Baltimore um, 
a, a black neighborhood it's black neighborhood now and if you I, I look his he was born in his 80s so if you look at the cohort of men born in the 1980s in that census tract of west baltimore more of the men from that census tract were in jail 25 years later than had gotten married uh, and and that was the generation of black men that were just absolutely hammered by some of the crackdowns that we saw. And like we can leave aside the arguments about the effectiveness or otherwise of that. It was absolutely clear that the uh, the biggest losers were black men. And I still think that we're we're struggling with that. And then of course HIV, AIDS epidemic, crack, and so on. We're still living with the consequences of that for black men and for black boys because one of the most important findings from the social science of all of this is that boys in low-income families or in very poor neighborhoods do worse than girls in the same families and neighborhoods so poverty affects boys more than girls hmm. and so then it becomes intergenerational and one of the results of uh, the difficulties of black men is to create much poorer black families because there's only so much black women can do of course on their own and that means that the black boys do worse hmm. Um, what does the left tend to get most wrong about when you know when they're talking about gender related disparities? Uh, they deny any biological differences, which we've already talked about. Still refuse to see that gender inequality can go both ways. So there is a gender equality, a gender policy council in the White House now. It used to be called the Council on Women and Girls. Now it's called the Gender Policy Council. But they haven't addressed a single gender inequality that runs the other way. It's only focused on those facing women and girls. And I think that's a political error, frankly, but also just wrong, uh, given some of the trends we've, we've talked about. And perhaps most important culturally, there is a tendency on the left, and here is more the progressive left than more generally, to talk about toxic masculinity and to really pathologize and individualize the problems of, of boys and men and to, and to somehow lump it on them and say, well, if you weren't so toxic, you'd be okay. Um, and, I find, and, and I find that term and the, the approach that's taken there to be quite offensive, frankly. Um, my own uh, kids' high school had an outbreak of toxic masculinity, which definitely influenced me me writing about this. Um, yeah, can you briefly recap? Yeah, that? so what happens? A very liberal public school in Bethesda, and uh, a boy, a high uh, boy, had writ had created a list of uh, girls they found most attractive and shared it with his friends. A hot or not list um, is what they're referred to sometimes. And then a girl accidentally saw it complained to the principal, the boy was suspended and apologized. Everyone thought that was the end. Then there was a protest. The national media got involved, ended up being on all the major national networks um, as an example of toxic masculinity and the fight back from the girls. There were massive public meetings. The boy in question apologized to not only the school and the girls, he apologized in person to the Washington Post in, in exchange for them not printing his name. Um, and the whole thing just went Berserk. What was interesting to me about it, I'm not I'm not defending what they were doing. I would describe that as immature masculinity, not toxic. Right? You don't do that when you're 26. You don't do that in workplaces. Um, you you learn you learn what's appropriate and what's not. But for boys to share a list of of girls they found attractive, for that to become a national media story about toxic masculinity, showed me the term itself has become absolutely useless. It used to be have some use in academia, but it's now just honestly a label that's slapped on anything boys and men do that the user disapproves of hmm. and therefore useless term. And, and not only useless, but actually harmful. You use, or you, you point out that interestingly, uh, you know, a traditional kind of uh, analytical move on the left is to talk about things in systemic or structural, structural terms. Yeah. But when it comes to this, it, tends to be individual failings that they point out or, yeah. or they cast it in those terms. Yeah. I mean, I wonder sometimes if it isn't a little bit cathartic because it is the only victim blaming left on left on, mm. on the left now. Yeah. Um, I think generally I, I agree with the, the search for structural explanations for different inequalities, mm. but this is, this is the one exception that progressives allow themselves, mm. um, which is they're quite happy to blame men for their plight. And I think that's largely wrong and frankly immoral. I uh, must say I'm neither a right winger nor a left winger, but I kind of am with the left on that. When I see men acting badly, I tend it's to toxic. think it's well. It's not that it's toxic, but it yeah they sh they should do something about it. it you know well, they I, shouldn't I, do it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I retreat <laughs> from a structural uh, perspective, perhaps to a more individual one. Hmm. Let's uh, talk about what about the right. What yeah. do, what does the right tend to miss on uh, you know when discussing this issue? Well, I think I mean to be fair, I think the the, the 
the left traditionally are better at doing some things that would help men, like infrastructure investments and so on. The right actually overweight biology very often. And so there's a tendency, to, it's the mirror image of the problem on the left to deny it, which is to use biological explanations for gender inequalities that really can't be explained by it. So, you know, of course there aren't any women politicians, you know, mm-hmm. they don't care about status. And of course there aren't women engineers, their brains don't work that way or would no take whichever stereotype you want there's still a little bit of that on the right and you'll see that in the work of even people like jordan peterson mm-hmm. um where he explained he explained away the fact that only five percent of engineers were women on biological grounds and that's in my view absurd um what, can so, you explain why that is absurd you have a chart in the book which mm-hmm. looks at uh, the number of women who say they would like to do a certain kind of yes. uh stem kind yes. of job and then what in reality they are. And what's interesting is that in, in many of the cases, they're it's kind of good. equal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That, like, in math and science. Yeah. Yeah, so what the chart does is it, it, it uh, this is from Rong Su and James Rounds, what they do is they, they actually take personality profiles of men and women, and particularly on this dimension of people versus things. Mm-hmm. So on average, men are a bit more into things, women a bit more into people, but the distributions hugely overlap. There are plenty of women into things and plenty of men who are more into people. Um, And so what they did was they said, imagine a world where those preferences were being played out perfectly in in the labor market. And they estimated that in in that world, about 30% of engineers would be women and about 30% of nurses would be men. Right now, it's 15% of engineers are women and only about 10% of nurses are men. Hmm. Now, I think that's important for a couple of reasons. One, it's not 50%, right? So even under conditions of perfect quality and choice, you might not get to 50% in every profession. Mm -hmm. And that's okay if it's really the result of preferences and choice. But the idea that 5% is likely to be explained by biological differences, Mm -hmm. especially when all we had to do was open the doors and lots of women Mm -hmm. became engineers. And so any moment in history, you could take a percentage and say, oh, it's because of biology. Right. Right? Um, And I think what you need to do is be much more patient than that. And I'm suspicious of anything where it's like 5%, 2%. I think one exception, I tested this on my very, very liberal feminist junior staff, which is deep sea fishing. Hmm. And they're like, no, no, the men can do that. That's fine. Because it's like 98% men. They're like, yeah, that's fine. We we, we have no interest in deep sea fishing. So they were comfortable with like a 2% female Hmm. representation in certain things. Okay. Uh, I'm with the girls on that one. Uh, I'll <laughs> eat it. I mean, I'll I, eat it, but I won't catch it. So, uh, what so, else does the right get wrong? Um, I think that the the reaction to what are genuine issues for men by actually just modeling uh, an immature form of masculinity as a kind of you know third finger to the left, and I think Donald Trump is almost an avatar of that, and to almost in reaction to what's happening so to celebrate a form of masculinity and Josh Hawley's on this train now as well which is in my view boorish adolescent i mean i you know i know what 16 year old boys are like i used to be one i've raised three and i look at a lot of what's happening and i see it as that and what that does is not just wrong but i think that it takes these real issues and it just weaponizes them into a grievance so it turns a problem turns it into a grievance um, and that's a problem for our politics, but it then also leads nowhere in terms of solutions. There's no solution on the right. Can you um, yeah, explain what you mean? Like what's something that Trump or Hawley did, you know, that is particularly illustrative of this kind of boorish bullshit response? Well, I mean, of course, there were the, some of the famous tapes that came out from Trump mm. um, and the way he, he acted around and towards women, um, which... I'm not saying he necessarily himself then went out of his way to celebrate, especially as president when he was running, but certainly many of his supporters did. Uh, and so it did, it did come to symbolize a, what I see as, a, a, as an adolescent masculine reaction to the political correctness as they perceived it on the left. But I think in term, what it troubles me about it is in terms of policy, if you read Josh Hawley's speech, and he has his own book coming out called Manhood, Recovering yeah. the Masculine Virtues, um, uh, what his what are his policies? He wants to bring back manufacturing jobs. Mm-hmm. Good luck with that, Senator. Uh, and he wants a marriage bonus in the tax system. So he wants to penalize people who aren't married by making them pay higher taxes. So people mm-hmm. who are married pay lower taxes, which is bonkers. And so that's it. That's all he's got. Mm-hmm. And so what they're doing is they're just take they're tapping into this issue, but they're using it to weaponize what I would see as you, a dangerous is he, is he going to subsidize the study of World War II among men? I think that would be good because this yeah. is a widely uh, 
you know, observed trend that when you reach a certain age, even as World War II recedes further and further in the past, you become obsessed with every documentary, every book, every yeah. movie about well, in the World UK, War it's, it's we're still World War One, so yeah. we're, we're still behind you. <laughs> <laughs> we have to catch up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, let's let's talk about solutions, and then we're going to go to some questions uh, from the audience. But um, let's work through your solutions. You have three kind of big ideas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's start with the first one, which has to do with, uh, you know, and, uh, I'll, you know, we'll speak slower for the men in the room, but it, it has to do with, <laughs> you know, basically keeping kids out of school or keeping boys, boys out of school a, an extra year. Yeah. So just as default, I think, start the boys in school a year later. Uh, we sort of half did that with one of our kids and really should have just gone the whole way. Um, and obviously, especially if they're young for their year. But given that we do have this pretty clear difference in the the pace of development um, between girls and boys, then just starting the boys a year later would level the playing field somewhat. Does it really though? I mean, like, what what is the what's the effect of that ultimately? I mean, I get the idea of it, and, mm-hmm. but why not two or three years? If I mean, if they're that far behind well because the evidence for how far they are behind varies mm-hmm. um and so i think a year is i mean some people think a year is crazy radical so let's let's start with a year and then see what happens um but the only evidence we have so far is from kids who have been uh and boys especially who've been held back a year mm-hmm. i don't actually like that language who started a year later mm-hmm. um and they do seem to it's the boys that benefit so they do seem to get some benefit from that extra year so i don't know how this exactly work i'm mm-hmm. talking to some school districts about it now um but it, but it could be an extra year of pre-k interestingly mm-hmm. private schools are already doing it i got the data from a well-known east coast private school can you uh, name a no. name no no, I can't, unfortunately. No. Yeah. Um, they shared their data with me, which was kind of them, um, and they gave me the birth dates for the kids in the school. Um, and among the graduating seniors, 30% of the boys were old for their year. In other mm. words, they shouldn't they shouldn't have been in that year, and it's only about 5% of the girls. And so at some point along the way, maybe at the beginning, the boys had been um, had a later start. And it turns out that's pretty common practice mm. in a lot of private schools is for the boys to start later. And it's, this is one of those ideas where you say it to policy wonks and we're all like, oh, we'd have to evaluate it and the distributions really overlap and it's very rubber. And then you say it to all the educators, every principal, teacher, they go, absolutely. absolutely. I, um, my older son, uh, he ended, we ended up moving before he started uh, kindergarten even, but uh, we were in Texas hmm. and it was common for parents to hold boys out an extra year because they wanted them to be bigger for sports. For sports, yeah. I mean, and, and it was yeah. a widely showing, yeah. acknowledged, uh, you know, kind of Yeah, practice. so that's the other reason people have historically but, done it. But, I, but then I'm, I'm going to say, like, nobody's <laughs> looking at, oh, Texas. Those, you know, the boys are doing really no, well no, there, right? That's right. It, it's, it's, that was a, a very different reason to do it. Yeah. And what I'm suggesting is we do it for academic reasons, not athletic reasons. Uh-huh. Um, uh, your next uh, reform. Well, in education, I, I'll say them briefly, I want more male teachers. Yeah. Uh, and more vocational education. I think you know a thousand more technical high schools would be a good idea. Mm. Um, that seems to be particularly beneficial to boys uh, compared to girls to have more vocational education. I think that would be great. I want a huge campaign uh, equivalent to the one we've had to get women, more women into STEM, to get more men into what I call HEAL, which we've already talked a bit about, health, education, administration, and literacy. These are mm-hmm. huge jobs. For every one job we're going to create in STEM, we're going to create three in HEAL. Mm-hmm. In those, I mean, of course, health and education are huge sectors, and again, very, very, very female dominated, and becoming more so. Mm-hmm. So, I think we do need male only scholarships to get into some of those areas, just mm-hmm. as we've had female only scholarships into STEM. I would like to see some that are specifically targeted. I want male only scholarships for people going into early years education, mm-hmm. especially for my son, mm-hmm. um, but more generally. And then, when it comes to fa- to the family. Um, there's a couple of things. One is, and here I know I'm going to lose a libertarian audience for sure. I would like really generous paid leave for both mothers and fathers mm-hmm. on an equal basis. I think it's very important that it's on an equal basis and it's attached to the individual father and mother and not transferable between the two. Finland's just done something similar. Mm-hmm. So again, if you think Finland is a great model, and, and we all do, of, are you, everyone you know, in this we room, love does, Finland. I know. Yeah, I mean, we're just um, dominating the pre-taping uh, conversation. Yeah, I know how, how popular Finland is, Finland is, especially here. Yeah. Um, but also the way in which unmarried fathers are treated in the U.S. right now is really unconscionable. Uh, in every in, in what way in the every U.S. state, if a child is born outside marriage, which is now forty percent of kids, by the way, um, a child is born outside marriage, the presumed legal default is full sole custody for the mum. The dad has to prove paternity and then go to court. Mm-hmm. In the meanwhile, they'll come after him for child support. 
And those two processes are entirely separate for unmarried fathers. So we have one bit of the government that treats them like a walking ATM. And then the other bit where he has to actually literally fight um, uh, for access to his kids. If you're married, the system works pretty well. Because the divorce laws do both right. of those things together. You do the money bit and the access bit, and you right. kind of figure it out. And, and now and in most states, the the default, default is, is equal custody. Yeah, or, and it's or, a yeah. huge change. About matching fathers now getting about a third mm-hmm. of the time with the kids after divorce. It's just been a, an amazing positive change. But is there evidence that that makes uh, men more responsive as fathers? Uh, the trouble is that because we've seen a, a change in – the class gradient in marriage Mm -hmm. it didn't used to be a class gradient in marriage it's a big one now is i think the people selecting into marriage are doing so largely to raise their kids together so if the marriage ends the the commitment of the kids survives Mm -hmm. it so i don't know whether the trend i think that people who are like pro pro being a, a engaged parent are more likely to get married in the first place and so it's hard to tell whether the divorce law is contributing to more engaged fathering or whether it was just more engaged fathers getting married in the first place. And you can't get divorced unless you get married, of course. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the the nursing statistics are really interesting mm. because nursing is something that is within reach of a lot of people, yeah. um, you know, based on the education that's necessary and, and the proclivity to do it. Um, and there are so few male nurses. I mean, and, you know, it is clearly, it's it's a feminized vocation and things like that. Walk through how you would go about making it more acceptable socially for both men and women for there to be more male nurses. Yeah. Well, what, you, you know, what does that process You're right like? in your description of it. And I blame Florence Nightingale for a lot uh, of she's it. She's a real uh, bitch. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Uh, I think she did fine okay. work in the Crimea for us Brits. But she did basically say men can't be allowed to be nurses. I mean, she's on record as saying men can't mm. nurse. Um, and she professionalized the nursing profession, but she did so absolutely on female grounds. So it's, it's mm. not a new problem. Um, it's less true in other countries, by the way. So if you mm. look at a lot of African countries, for example, there, there are a lot more men doing nurses. The fact that you can say male nurse, by the way, is just so indicative, right? right. When was the last time you said female lawyer or female doctor? Right. Um, so it shows how far we have to go. Um, and a disproportionate number of the nurses we do have are actually immigrants as well. Mm. So it's not necessarily American men who are becoming nurses. And I think that's because of this, just this strong sense of being gendered. So what do we do about that? We have to reduce what Claudia Golden calls the auras of gender that surround professions, but that doesn't happen by itself. So I'd start with nursing faculty. 95% of nursing faculty are female. If the people teaching the subject are all all women, it's going to get, it's hard to persuade boys that they should study that subject. So I would like to see some incredibly strong uh, moves to get more men teaching it. Uh, How How do you do that? Uh, well, you have you throw money at it to some extent. Mm-hmm. I mean, in just the same way, there are incredibly strong financial incentives for women going into STEM. And there is massive affirmative action uh, happening to get more women teaching STEM. So everything else equal, a woman applying for a job teaching STEM has got twice twice the chance of getting the job as the equivalent man. Because there's this huge push to get more women teaching STEM. Mm. Great. Well, maybe we could have the same ratio the other way around for men teaching nursing. Um, so and I would do you that. would also say that for um, educate uh, K yeah. through twelve, particularly K through eight. Yeah, and especially uh, yeah, middle school teachers, elementary school teachers, and English teachers. Mm. Uh, English you know, men teaching English seems to have a particularly big effect on boys learning English in the same way that women teaching math have historically helped girls doing math. So I can imagine you know we'd have specific scholarships to encourage more men to consider teaching as a profession, and especially if they chose to do something like English. English. It's all been about STEM up until this point. Mm-hmm. They're really neglecting English. Yeah. And I have to say, as somebody who was always, uh, e- English came easier to, or lit- language came easier to me than math. Mm-hmm. I am still puzzled by people who find math easier, whether they're male or Same. female. It just makes no sense to no, me. So I'm, I'm they're idiots. I, I and I think they're lying about it. But yeah. um, <laughs> what else? What else is, uh, you know, um, and, you know, and, and when you say something like, uh, you know, how, how do you sell uh, affirmative action for male nurses <laughs> I, or, or for faculty for male well, nurses? Well, I, I started off trying to sell it on kind of labor market grounds, mm-hmm. right? So I was, I was looking at it, so look, at the, look at the labor market trends. Yeah. That's where the jobs are. Here's a bunch of men that need work. Here's a bunch of jobs. Why don't we get more of them yeah. to do that? And by the way, teaching and nursing have some labor shortages right now. Um, and so we're sort of trying to solve them with half the workforce. So it's felt like it, just from a labor market perspective. I actually now think the much better sell is... If you've ever been in a hospital or a care home 
or one is a psychologist, you quite often do want someone of the same sex as you. Mm-hmm. You know, you do want someone. And so I've actually, you know, I had a conversation with this woman from a very kind of liberal uh, magazine and she was- Can you name a uh, name? Uh, yeah, I can actually. This case it was, it was okay. Salon Magazine. Uh, okay. It was Mary Elizabeth Williams. And she, um, she was talking about the experience of her father in a, in a care home and how there were literally no men to help him go to the bathroom. Hmm. Um, and you can imagine if you're a woman, you probably want a woman to help you go to the yeah. bathroom and vice versa. And so I actually think that from a social welfare point of view, saying to parents, wouldn't it be great to have more men teaching your sons and coaching your sons in schools? Wouldn't it be great to have more male nurses so that, so that if you're in hospital and you need actually that kind of care, especially more intimate care, you could have a man and, and so on. So I think that's a better sell now, which is to say, what kinds of professions do we want? Do we really want them to just be all female? And as soon as you talk about it from the point of view of the user of the services, mm. very few people actually want that. So do we need some affirmative action, some scholarship, mm. some money? Given where we are, I would say yes. Yeah. We did the same the other way around. So I think it's time to do it this way around. Uh, what about the Votech stuff? Because, uh, you know, it... Uh you know, there there was a time, and again, people of uh, of a certain vintage will remember a time when you know going to the vocational technical track of your high school was not odd, and it wasn't looked down upon mm-hmm. or anything. It was mm-hmm. you know just part of the the reality. Um, reinscribing that into education seems very hard, and it also, I have to say, as somebody who would have been slotted into that kind of thing. Um, had I been born at a, at an earlier mm. time because of you know my parents' education levels and stuff like that, I worry about it because I, I mean it makes obvious mm. sense. We need a lot of people who can fix you know air conditioning and heating systems and do plumbing and you know various kinds mm. of trade jobs. Um, but you know how how do you put that back into a system where people are you know very uncomfortable with the idea of being tracked and kind of pushed into. Yeah what are considered working class upbringing or professions. So, yeah, I think I mean, there's a history of tracking, of course, which is uh, through in the U.S. perspective can, was seen through the lens of race as well. Mm. Um, I think one of the unfortunate consequences of the recoil away from that has been actually to leave a lot of boys and men struggling. Um, I, I think it's important to say that the Votex stuff can be the trades you just talked mm. about, and there are some good good trades there still to be had, but it can also be in some of these healthcare professions. I mean, there's a, mm-hmm. there's a lot of Votech um, that can lead you to sort of healthcare qualifications, mm-hmm. even short of being a nurse, being a healthcare aide and things like that. And so I actually would like to see Votech becoming a little bit more balanced more generally. But the honest answer is like, I, I think you just do it. I mean, the evidence that the demand is there is huge. If you look at the states that have a lot of technical high schools, they're all oversubscribed. Mm. Massachusetts and Connecticut, for example. So there appears to be demand. And if they're high quality Mm. and students are doing well afterwards, of course parents are going to line up for that. And so I think to that extent, let's just let the market decide. And I would love Mm. it if there were more places where it was an option for boys and girls. Yeah. Is there a question of, say, something with health aids and whatnot? Um, You know, are the people at the top of the pyramid they don't want to give up, you know, they, they don't want to increase the supply of people who are basically doing their job. So right. doctors don't like uh, nurse, nurse practitioners, practitioners and, and it bumps all the way down. How yeah. much of that is a factor in a kind of rigid labor market um, for these types of professions? Well, I think it's, I mean, it's a factor. And I think you probably know more about this than me, but Jonathan Rothwell's work on, on this, I think is quite powerful too, which are, there's clearly some rents uh, in a lot of these professions. They clearly don't want some of these barriers to be broken down. Um, whether that's a specifically a specific problem for boys and men, I couldn't say, but is it a problem in those sectors? For sure. What it does mean is that we put artificial caps on your ability to rise up the occupational ladder by insisting that at a certain point you need a certain qualification. And that's not always true. It's just used as a way to cap certain people. Um, and you've just given a couple of good examples. And it may be, and here I'm speculating, maybe you could attract more men into those professions if they didn't think that they were going to get part way up and then get stuck because they didn't get a four-year college degree. Uh, let's uh, have some audience uh, questions. I uh, I notice a lot of men hands yeah. are going up. Well, that's okay. I, I don't know. Is, isn't that okay this time? I don't know how I feel about just, that. Just I'm going to walk as far as I can with this cord, and some of you may have to meet me part way. But let's, sir, you had your uh, hand up. What's your question? So the Proud Boys have obviously been politically toxic for a long time, uh, but Gavin McGinnis seems like a reasonable person, and he's he he he, he he's you, you obviously have never met him, but he initiated uh, this uh, movement with the idea that yes, men are being specifically targeted or right. um, or 
criminalized. And mm-hmm. same thing with Western culture, that it's unnecessarily being described as toxic, toxic max- masculinity. So how do you feel about that all? Oh. And we'll also point out that the Proud Boys, you uh, you get beat in by uh, having cereal pelted at you or you know punched while you name breakfast cereals. And his initial uh, his initial prospects seemed reasonable. I don't know. Richard. Tell me tell me a bit more about him. Why why do you well, think he's reasonable? His initial prospect was that boys aren't necessarily toxic, right. and and Western culture isn't the worst thing in the world. Right. And so he kind of founded this organization, right. which of course got way out of hand. Sure, uh, but he founded this to defend both boys and Western culture. Right. So of course, if that's the extent of his views, that would be fine. Um, uh, and what we've done is we've created a vacuum by making it possible to say things. Uh, that should be uncontroversial and they sound controversial um, because of a failure for other people to even engage with them at all. And so if you're silent on issues like the problems facing boys and men, then it's very easy for people like him to come along and say, see, there's a war on men. There's a war on boys. We're, you know, we're, the, the whole society is being feminized and we're crushing the male spirit and blah, blah, blah. And it's all bullshit, frankly. But it can be made to sound plausible if people aren't engaging with the issue and saying, yeah, there are issues with working class men and yeah, we do need to worry about this. And by the way, the whole toxic masculinity thing could definitely go too far. If we're having that conversation, then it wouldn't create the kind of room that I think he is, he and others are able to create because on the face of it, he says stuff that like men aren't inherently toxic and not everything about Western culture is bad. If that, are those shocking <laughs> statements? <laughs> well, only in a context where you've allowed too much space to be created in your political culture. Um, okay, uh, another question. Thank you. I've also uh, I've known Gavin McGinnis for almost twenty years, and, uh, and you're wrong on every single thing that you just said about him. But um, I'm as sorry, far I'm wrong. oh no, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I'm wrong uh, or he's wrong. No, he's wrong. No, yeah, you're, you're okay. right. No, but, I agree. in um, that case, I agree with uh, you. For, and I'd be interested in what Nick thinks too. <laughs> but what do you think from what you guys are saying as far as the tra- trajectory is concerned? Where do we see men 10, 20, 30 years from now? Yeah. Well, I think it. I think it slightly depends how how we react in this in this moment, right? Uh, these these are not these trends are longstanding, and I think there are some signs of hope. I think there are some signs that. Um, that we're rethinking some of these questions, even just this conversation that we're having is that we're willing to talk about some of these issues. So I, I am hopeful that if we invest in different kinds of education, as Nick and I just discussed, that that will get better. I think we will reform some aspects of family law. I, w- I do think that there, I think that we'll be able to talk about the importance of fathers uh, in a way that perhaps was a bit harder five years ago. Um, and so I think there's, the, the group I'm really looking at, honestly, are the 25 to 34 year old men. Because the, the older men, they've been hit really hard by some of these late market shocks. Uh, the younger men haven't so much. They're coming into a world where the dating market's completely changed, the economy's completely changed. We have seen a drop in labor force participation among that group, but I'm also seeing quite a lot of signs of hope in that group. Uh, and so I don't know. Hannah Rosen wrote this book, The End of Men, which I quote a lot. Um, and things have gotten worse since then. And she said, oh, things will get better. And they haven't yet in many ways. Um, so I don't know, but I would say kind of watch the young men. Speaking incredibly anecdotally, one of the things that does make me feel pretty good is my own sons, who I think are trying to sort of be pro-social. To, they're not apologetic about them. They are male, but they've got incredibly egalitarian relationships. They're tired of all the culture war bullshit. They just want to get on. They want to flourish. They want the women around to flourish. They just want to get on. And so I, I feel a little bit of sense of it coming out of some of the worst of the um, the difficulty of even talking about the issue. If we're talking about it, I think we'll get we'll, we'll get better. It is fascinating with the labor force participation rates. Ge- there's a generational difference where yes. people over 55 are working a lot more than they used to, right. and people under about yes. 40 or 45 are working less, less than they used to. Yeah, and not so only because they're at college either, yeah. which is right. Yeah, so that's a, that's a strange trend. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, could you speak more about the, the basically the gender, um, gender power uh, when it comes to economical power, uh, uh, wage gap, mm-hmm. um, I don't know, the, the kind of a percentage of people in the boardrooms, in, mm-hmm. in tech, in finance, in gaming world, in... I don't know where Hollywood, etc. Is th- is this all a myth that that the left is talking about, like how th- this kind of disparaged women are? And if you can talk more about the 
kind of major crimes and how does that informs us uh, to trust men less? So on the on the question of what's the real story around gender power and power relations, it depends where you're looking. You know, if you're looking at the apex of society, including in politics and corporate life, you still see huge gender disparities favoring men. And I think that's part of the problem of this conversation, honestly, is that if you look around in the elite, you're like, well, I don't, uh, wait, only 44 uh, women running Fortune 500 companies, only one in four members of Congress, women. Uh, and so what are you talking about? And actually, my wife is raising money now for a startup. So I know very, very personally that only 2% of venture capital money goes to female founders. So if you look in certain places, you still you do see huge gaps and, and work to be done. But if you look elsewhere and you look at working class families in particular and you look further down the economic distribution, the story is very different, right? And so actually the big change in economic power has been much more at the top and less in the middle and at the bottom rather than necessarily um, between men and women. But I think it's important to say that the, the feminist movement recognized that the key goal was to secure econ sufficient economic independence to make marriage a choice, not a necessity, to break the chains of dependency that had historically been really at the kind of heart of traditional families. I completely support that goal, and I think it has been very significantly achieved in advanced economies. And I think all the stats show that. And that is a profound change in our society and in our culture, which we have to come to terms with. But it relates to the second part of your question, which is that the conservatives who are writing about this in the 70s, we were talking about George Gilder before we, before we started this, what they warned was if the men become economically less necessary, they're going to form marauding bands of kind of Mad Max style, crazed, like there's, we're going to have massive violence, it's going to be a huge problem. Right? He really worried, he said you're going to have basically savagery, right? these guys are going to go off the rails. If they don't have this purpose, they're going to go off the rails completely wrong. Violent crime has halved in the last few decades. Maybe back to some of the screen stuff we were talking about. But actually crime rates are way, 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 way down, including for men. And so the thing that the conservatives were worried about was, would, was these men would be marauded around in an uncivilized band. The opposite's happened. There's been a huge drop in crime. Now, that's not to say we don't need more of a drop in crime, but it is important to note that along with all the problems I've talked about, the violent crime rates have. And um, of course, in recent years, there's been, you know, this has been a spike right. and there are all kinds of issues around the US cities right now. But as a general proposition, one of our great achievements has been this extraordinary drop in violent crime. Um, we have time for about one more or two more. Um, uh, how do you feel about single sex education? You know, when you talk about how uh, schools are hostile to boys. It, it strikes me that they always have been to a certain extent that you've got to sit still. Mm -hmm. And also that, that so much of what's happened lately is getting rid of grades, getting rid of competition in schools, which boys mm -hmm. love. Uh, um, and they've gotten rid of that. And, you know, boys love to compete on video games. They'll spend hours doing it. But mm -hmm. but you ask them to write an essay about how they feel, you know, that's, and that's what school has become more now. So why not go back to a, a more single-sex education? Well, I think that the, the positive... That also eliminates the red problem uh, well, to some work. extent it does yeah um because they're at least developmentally you know with with their peers but um look i'm <laughs> i like the idea that it would ensure assuming you have more male teachers that the idea of you know educational success and excellence and masculinity were not somehow at odds with each other i think that's important my own english teacher was male and i think it mattered that he was frankly um so i'm not against it if people want to do it it's great but i looked really hard at the evidence as to what its effectiveness there is none. So it doesn't do any harm, single sex education, but it doesn't really seem to do any good either. Is um, that true so, for women though too? Because yeah. I've heard a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of a lot women of say, saying, yeah, hey, get, you know, if you get better. the boys out of the classroom. Yeah. So there used to be some evidence, this is going back to the UK now, where it seemed mm. to not make any difference for boys, but it seemed to help girls. And the reason it helped girls was you get all the disruptive boys out of the classroom and let them focus on their studies. Um, but if you look at the studies that would be done in the US of any quality, you really just don't find any, any good outcomes. The problem to be really boring about it for a moment is the kinds of people choosing to send their kids to single sex schools are not your typical parent. So there's massive selection effect in there anyway. But the studies that looked at it hard are just like, I'm, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it. And by the way, like my idea of starting schools a year later in school is trivial by comparison to separating the entire education system. Like we're obviously not going to do it for most of our kids. So um, let's have uh, one more question and we'll continue the conversation after, but sir. Thanks. What with the increase in out of wedlock births and the resultant lack of father figures at home, how big a factor do you think that is in the decline of 
more traditional masculinity? The evidence was stronger than I expected to find that fathers matter to their kids as fathers. Uh, I didn't honestly expect to find the effects to be as big. I assume big. your three sons were telling you that all along. Yeah. You know, why, exactly. why are you oh, still yeah. here? Yeah, that's all yeah. I could hear is, Dad, you're so important yeah. to me. Please spend more yeah. time with me. Please share more of your wisdom with me. Yes, I'd love to spend two hours what, on the phone. Directly. What happened that's during the Battle that's of the right. Bulge? Yeah, yeah. Dad, yeah. Dad, tell, yeah. It, tell us again how you learned about... Yeah, yeah no. Um, but... Uh, uh, including for girls, actually, yeah. but but it seems particularly in a in adolescence that actually fathers do seem to kind of come more into their own in those kind of teenage years with both girls and boys, um, and especially important for boys. As to why, and I don't think it's so much in my view about like quotes traditional masculinity, you know, because I, I was a stay at home dad for quite a while, but I hope I was still modeling a way of being a dad that my kids could learn from. My own dad was very much a traditional one, but. But it was really just that sense of contributing to being a being a provider in a broader sense, provider of care more generally. And so it is a problem that if men don't have anymore this traditional breadwinning role, which increasingly they don't, that they don't get benched as a result. The problem is if we continue to frame being a successful dad in those terms, given the changes we've seen in our society and the economy, fewer and fewer men are going to be able to tick that box. And the result is to make them feel redundant, not just economically redundant, but culturally redundant and of, of no use to their family anymore. And I think that's disastrous, not just for the men, but also for the children in their households. Fathers matter, period, not just as breadwinners. And we've got to get past the idea that father's role is restricted in that way and that they're in their kids' lives, whether they're married to the mother or not, that they need to be in their kids' lives and they really matter. And there has been such a reluctance among politicians to engage with that. Barack Obama didn't want to do it for reasons of scaring the left. Donald Trump couldn't do it because God knows he didn't want to talk about family and fatherhood. And so the result is there's a real lack of leadership and a real lack of people just saying, yeah, mums usually matter, but dads really matter too as well. Well, maybe when Herschel Walker becomes the senator go. from Georgia. Problem, we'll problem have, solved. Yeah, you know, <laughs> finally we'll have a role model. <laughs> who contains multitudes. Um, I guess as a final uh, uh, kind of comment, can you talk about, has there ever been a time when masculinity or maleness hasn't been in crisis? No. Um, and so <laughs> I, I don't want to dissuade, I, I mean, I, I think everyone should read your book and I think everybody Absolutely. should take it seriously. I, I, I didn't say buy. I just said read, but uh, no, they should buy your book as well. Uh, and if it's a choice between buying and reading, just buy the book. Yeah, or listen to uh, it. But, um, you know, what does it say that we we have always been stumbling from one crisis in masculinity where either men are, or, you know, are too masculine and have no emotional life and thus uh, visit horrors upon society or they are too weak and they are no longer, tradi right. you know, people say traditionally masculine. I I really don't know what that means uh, other sure. than in the most cliched way. So what do we do with that? As so I'm, I will say the first thing is I'm very careful not to talk about a crisis mm -hmm. of masculinity. Uh, I think the closest we get to it is in response to the last question around the role of fathers. I think that's the closest we get um, because it's just it's cheap to say the crisis of masculinity. And as you say, there's basically been one every, right, before Vietnam, after Vietnam, before World War II, after Vietnam. You know, there's a, Arthur Schlesinger has a piece in Esquire from 1958, the crisis of masculinity, how rising female power will emasculate, et cetera. Um, so the two things I would say about that. One is what it tells us is that masculinity is always, to some extent, fragile. It has to be socially constructed. It has to be culturally constructed. And so, you know, when was the last crisis of femininity? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that does speak to something, which is that we know at some level that masculinity is a work in progress and that finding models and scripts for masculinity that work with the modern world is hugely important. The difference this time around, I would say, even though I don't call it a crisis of masculinity, is that previously all these crises of masculinity have not really been accompanied by any apparent ill effects on the men. They've been earning well, they've been you know, running companies, they've been employed, uh, et cetera. Whereas now, actually, there are some material problems facing boys and men. And so this time around, if you were to say there was a crisis, it's not just a crisis in the febrile imagination of the public intellectuals who want to sell a book or an article. There's actual problems in actual men's lives. And that's a, that is genuinely a departure from the previous so-called crises. 
All right. Well, uh, a final question. Uh, your name is Richard V. Reeves. Yes. What does the V stand for? Well, I first of all want to say that the V was inserted because I kept getting confused mm-hmm. for the famous historian Richard Reeves mm-hmm. and asked to give talks about Nixon and Kennedy, mm-hmm. which he was an expert on. And I would go and give talks on Nixon <laughs> and Kennedy. But um, but I was exposed as, as not knowing very yeah. much relatively quickly. So the V is there. And actually, uh, the 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 name is Vaughan, or if you'd like it in the Welsh, I'm half Welsh, mm. is Vaughan. And it's a name that's been in the in my Welsh family for as long as anyone can remember. And is Thanks it a boy's us. name? Uh, it is a boy's name. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank we're going to leave it there. I want to thank Richard, Richard V. Reeves, Richard Vaughn Reeves. Uh, the book is of boys and men, why the modern male is struggling, why it matters, and what to do about it. Thank you so much.